All right, UFC Vegas 46 went down on Saturday, January 15th from the UFC Apex in Las Vegas, Nevada. And the event was headlined by an incredible featherweight bout between Calvin Cater, number five ranked Calvin Cater, and number eight ranked Giga Shikadze. And uh, Cater defeated Shikadze with a dominant performance to cash as a plus 200 betting underdog. Handed Shikadze his first defeat uh, since coming into the UFC in 2019. And then, uh, you know, from there, it was just, it, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't an overly spectacular card, but I feel like that main event was, you know, well worth the price of admission. And uh, yeah, what's up, guys? Uh, uh, Liam and Locks here. And uh, yeah, another, uh, the first post show of 2022, and uh, just another awesome fight night that was not that great of a card, but just the main event was just absolutely killer. And uh, some some good stuff to talk about here. Uh, first of all, I didn't even ask you when we uh, just off the air. Liam, how was uh, just your betting night in general? Yeah, so uh, I would say overall it was a really uh, good night for me from a betting perspective. Uh, had a couple of beats not go my way. I was telling you guys uh, a little bit in the lobby. You know, I had a couple parlays, long shots, lotto tickets that uh, didn't didn't come through for me, including that Calvin Cater KO in the main event. I thought he had it with three seconds left on the clock. Uh, I couldn't tell if they were stopping the fight from the bell or or from the shots he was throwing on top. So, uh, you know, it was a, a great fight night, uh, though I ended up profiting 4.29 units uh, for a 23% ROI. So always happy with the night in the green. Good way to start off the year and uh, looking forward to the pay-per-view next week and crack into that uh, tonight and tomorrow. Excuse me, tomorrow. So really excited about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll get to that because that's a whole other uh, can of worms to uh, unravel. But Locks, how did uh, how did your good night go as far as uh, just the overall betting? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't bad between uh, I had one play on KSW today and between that and UFC came away with a cool uh, 1.33 units. So not the biggest win, but I'm not going to complain about a, a positive night. So all in all, it was good. Yeah, for me, it was just, it, I it came down to I was either going to lose nothing, like just straight up plus zero on the night, or, you know, I was up a unit going into the main event. So I was either going to go up two units and walk away with uh, on the cater bet. And uh, that's ended, ended up what, what happened. And, you know, it was the, the underdog won four of the 10 fights. So the favor went six, six and four. Uh, the underdog ended up making profit on the straight up money line and the over eight of the 10 fights went the distance. I feel like, a you know, a couple of these fights that went the distance, st you know, even though they went the distance, the Algeo fight, which we'll get into the, obviously the main event, the Chicagian fight, the Roy Val fight, uh, which is again, another whole can of worms, all super fun fights, but uh yeah, just fights that went the distance. So yeah, let's just let's get into the first one here. Uh Bill Algio on uh to to open up this main card comes in as the betting underdog, wins by unanimous decision, picks up the decision at plus 320, uh picks up the win on the money line plus 145 he closed at. So he kind of swelled a little bit early there. The over two and a half rounds, cash at minus 150. Fight goes the distance, yes. Cashed it around minus 130 it closed at. And, uh, yeah, Liam, what did you think about this one? What did you have? Brutal. This is uh, the worst bet for me on the card. I had uh, three units on Brito here, although I did uh, beat the closing line pretty considerably. I had it at minus 116. I bet it as 2.2 units on the money line and then 0.75 units uh, on um, a, a parlay with Abdul Razak Al Hassan, that fight got canceled. As did a lot of fights that were scheduled on this card, so ended up with a straight bet there. A little more exposure than I would have liked. That's my hindsight regret. You know, I think he actually had the skill set to beat Algio even tonight. Um, made some boneheaded decisions. He's 26 years old. It was his first UFC fight, so you know, boneheaded decision by me, I guess, uh, laying any kind of chalk on him. But uh, I do think that Brito could have won the fight. You know, when he was on the feet, Bill was eating clean shots on the chin, uh, you know, especially in that third round. I thought he was even getting hurt on the feet. And then Brito just couldn't help but force the wrestling, force the clinch, 
couldn't help but come forward and ended up getting thrown on his ass for it. So embarrassing uh, way to end the fight. And, uh, you know, he'll learn from this. But, um, yeah, I think it was just a, a bad chalk play in hindsight. Yeah, my experience was definitely a lot better than yours was. Uh, Locks, what did you have on this one? I actually didn't have anything on this oh. one. But uh, yeah, Brito came out. He looked explosive as usual. He was looking for the takedowns a lot early. I'm not really sure if that was the best plan of attack. I mean, Aljo is, uh, was a lot taller and longer than him. Just makes it kind of difficult um, when you're chasing that stuff. I mean, he got them in the first round and got round one and two scorecards, but just kind of ran out of gas. And Aljo's a guy that can take punishment. He sticks around to the end, and it's not really a guy you want to gas out against. It's not that you really ever want to do that, but Brito outstruck him at distance, but Aljo just stuck around, made it greasy, much more active on the ground, more active in the clinch, outstruck him in the second round and the third round. And Got to take down each of those rounds. He got the win. Aljo's a good fighter. Had a big length and reach advantage to kind of cancel out that raw athleticism and got it done tonight. So it was a good win for him. Yeah, I thought it was... I, I was on Aljo and I thought this was I just my way of handicapping here. And sometimes I like to... It was just, you know, not, not kind of... Um, handcuffing myself by analysis i was just like i this is a close fight i'm gonna go with wherever closes as the plus money side and i'm only gonna bet a little bit so i had a one percent play on algeo and uh i thought yeah i honestly uh for the people that had burrito i thought the fight could have went either way it's just that algeo i kind of feel like veteran his way even if i don't even know if that's the right toughed his way to the win where it kind of just his experience and his uh, his willingness to go in there and take shots to put, you know, kind of just like style points, basically. And I thought he just dictated where the fight was going to go. And, uh, yeah, basically, it's one of those things where I, I, I just saw it, it's it, the price swelled on Bill Algio. And I was just like, you know what? At the end of the day, you really only need to get – one clear round and then a toss up round and he ended up winning all three. So yeah. Uh, Liam, any other closing thoughts on that one? Yeah. The only thing I was going to add that I forgot to mention was uh, I thought it was, you know, pretty uh, elementary wrestling mistakes that cost Brito down the stretch. You know, he was really wrestling with his hips far away from Algio against the fence. And that gave Bill the ability to reach over, do the same crotch lock, drop down and spin behind him like three times. I was like, dude, you can't make, you know, fool me one time. You know, it's like, don't make the same mistake over and over again. And I really thought that that was, uh, you know, just again, boneheaded decision making uh, in a few phases of the fight. So um, hindsight plus money was the side to be on. <laughs> well, I mean, I feel like tonight was, if you were really watching, there was a, tonight was like one of those nights where it was, if you really know MMA, it was one of those like, uh, I mean, that kind of sounds like a condescending way to frame it, but it, it was just one of those things where the guys that a lot of guys had the the way to win and they just did stupid things to kind of beat themselves. And on that note, uh, this next fight was ex exactly what I just said. Uh, Vyacheslav Borshev defeats Dakota Bush and Dakota Bush was winning this fight. <laughs> and then Vyacheslav Borshev landed a just, uh, you know, a, a world ending liver punch that ended the fight. And Borshev with just, you know, how could he have any better of a debut? Cash is at minus 180 on the money line. And I that's just one of those spots where I was just like, how did I not bet more on this guy? And he cashed at plus money, plus 120 on the TKO, plus 115 inside the distance. And uh, I had the over in this one, which is definitely not a good play in hindsight. The under two and a half rounds cashed at minus 150 and fight goes the distance. No, uh, minus 185. As far as notes go, I basically just said the way that the fight went. Uh, locks, do you have anything to say about this one? Because this was just pretty cut and dry. Yeah, I mean, there's not really too much to say. Some beautiful body shots, first finish of 2022, and uh, he, he's a top class striker. He showed that today, and yeah, it's the reason you got the win. Not too, not really too much else to uh, to, to say. Yeah, uh, Liam, like the like what we were just talking about with the 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 previous fight with Brito. I thought this one was so much more of just like he hurt Borshev, and 
you know, uh, you know, it was working on with wrestling and he was just like, he could have just kept wrestling him. And instead he's like, no, I'm going to fight this guy on the feet. This guy who has one shot knockout power. And he did it for like half a second too long. And then he paid for it. Uh, <laughs> any, anything you got to say about this one, Liam? Uh, yeah. So pre-fight, I was on the under here, um, you know, in a few different ways, uh, live, um, you know, also in my tracked uh, parlay that, that didn't end up cashing on, on the Roy Val fight, uh, not going under. But uh, that was, you know, another spot that looked, you know, fairly obvious to me. Both guys were the path to finish the fight. But I also did uh, think that uh, Borshev was going to win here. I also uh, put in a live bet on him as the price dropped a little bit. Uh, just because I felt like, um, you know, the margins for, for Bush were a lot smaller in this fight. If he fucked around on the feet for 30 seconds, he could die. And that's what happened. So uh, that was really the problem for me. He, he was like a spastic, frenetic striker. I've seen, um, you know, Slava get hurt and recover on the regional scene uh, and knock the guy out. And I've also seen Slava uh, get taken down, work his way back to guard, use a knee shield, get back up to his feet. So I, I, I felt like... Um, I had seen against better wrestlers, actually, uh, this guy he fought in LFA, I think it was, Starks. That guy is a much better wrestler, in my opinion, than Dakota Bush. So uh, th that that was something that was uh, standing out to me. He he had more chain takedowns than Bush, who's kind of like head-on, double legs. Yeah, I mean, it was... Uh... It was just pretty cut and dry. At first, I was just like, "Oh, well, this is this is this is an interesting, the, you know, this is an interesting fight. It's interesting to see that Dakota Bush was hanging around." And then it was just like, "Oh, he made one mistake, and the fight's over." And it was a spectacular debut, you know, similar to like uh, uh, what we saw with uh, Alex Pereira a couple of weeks ago, where it was just like, "Oh, you know, he he toyed around and just showed that he could MMA at this level," and then. You know, th that finish, especially to start 2022, you know, this this guy could be, I guess it's hard to call him the rookie of the year, but he's going to be the, he, he could potentially be fighter of the year, although I doubt that will happen, but story of the year, because who knows, this he might fight two, two or three more times, because he got in in January, now it's, sky's the limit for him, especially if we're going back to Fight Island or whatever uh so yeah this next one i honestly I, I said this to you guys before we started i thought this was just absolutely this is one of my favorite fights in quite a while just as a woman's fight uh caitlin chikagian picks up the unanimous decision win cashes as a minus 182 favorite over jennifer maya in their rematch uh she goes 2-0 and against her now uh minus 120 on the decision Minus 450 on the over two and a half, minus 350 on the fight goes the distance. Yes. And uh, yeah, I thought this was just a. I saw a lot of steam on Chicagian this week, and I saw a lot of people kind of just chasing steam, but I also saw a lot of people who I respect their opinion were just like, yeah, it's Chicagian all day at this spot, especially she's just so good at using range and she's. It was this just a tailor-made matchup, in my opinion. And uh, basically, I can't say anything else more than that. Liam, what did you have on this one? Yeah, so um, this was, again, part of my parlay was uh, betting that this fight is going to go to decision at minus 300. You know, it looked a little dicey there a couple times with Chuk all over uh, on the ground looking for position, looking for the submission. I was a little scared, but uh, broadly speaking, Felt like both ladies are tough, durable, not going to quit on themselves, uh, can fight for 15 minutes pretty reliably. So uh, that was my read going in on that. And then, uh, you know, I think it actually ended up being my biggest single bet on the card, 3.5 units, uh, Caitlin Chukagian to win via decision at minus 120. So a little bit of a sweat there, like I mentioned, but um, I felt like that was the vast majority of the win equity. Why am I going to pay minus 200 when I could get, you know, a really uh, significant uh, price drop? Um you know, and if the price drop was like 15 cents, 20 cents, a, a small percentage, you know, maybe I don't make that decision, but uh, it was a pretty significant gap. I could get the best available uh, price on my book. So I took advantage. Yeah, like I said, I feel like it was just a tailor-made matchup where 
like the threat of Maya's power would keep Shikagian at good enough distance where she would just p- pretty much pick her apart from the outside. And uh, basically that's what happened. And yeah, and, uh, uh, Locks, uh, were you about on the same look here? Oh yeah, I was all over uh, Shikagian here. This is my most confident play on the card. Um, and we basically already saw this fight before. I mean, Shikagian is just better than her in this matchup. I feel like the line should have opened probably like minus 200. I was really happy to play it at minus 155. Um, I'm not really that high on, on Maya, to be honest. I bet her decision prop last time out, and although it cashed, it was pretty damn close, and she didn't really look that good, in my opinion. Just a lot of singular strikes, and people talk about the grappling, like what if. I mean, she has two takedowns in her whole UFC career. Like She just doesn't really fight that way and usually she's the one that gets taken down actually uh, in her fights and she got taken down tonight um, but yeah singular strikes slow volume just a little bit too predictable and Shukagian is just better than her and uh, and showed that once again for the second time so yeah I thought it was a pretty uh, pretty easy one to call yeah it was it was an easy one to call and it just felt like you know I I, I, a, lot, a lot of people like give these types of fights shit, but honestly, this is this was great, high level, entertaining shit. Like this was this this is more entertaining than some of the men's fights on this card, which were pretty low quality, to be honest. Like uh, Shikagan, she's just she's just getting better. Like, and th- this is one of those fights where it's almost like a showcase matchup where it's a rematch against a, a person that she's fought. You're kind of almost giving a little bit of a an edge to the underdog just because you're, you're you're showing her your hand, right? You're coming in and giving her a chance to, you know, to get the to pull even with you and I just feel like Shikagan by giving herself these challenges it's the ne- next best thing to go in and get, going up to fight Shevchenko and you know losing terribly again uh so so, but beyond that I mean what's she gonna do she can go to Bellator they don't really have much of a flyweight division like uh I think if she went to Bellator she'd be she'd be like the she'd be like the uh you know the cyborg of the 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 flyweights right like you think she'd start getting finishes again well yeah that was the other thing too is uh the on her by decision it's just it's just it's an absolute lock if you've bet a hundred dollars on her to win by decision on every fight that she's had in the her last 11 fights since 2018 you're up 658 dollars so she's you're making 65 dollars a fight roughly 60 dollars a fight roughly picking if as a hundred dollar better betting on her by decision over that stretch with even the, if you're counting in the three losses you know, <laughs> so she's just a positive EV machine. And uh, this is one of those ones where I don't like to toot the horn going up. It's better. That's why I like doing this post show, because you can just you can we can do these subtle like, you know, the, everybody could everybody could, you know, chase the steam during the week. But then no one is no one is on here at two in the morning taking the L's. But this is the the rare time that we can take a bunch of um, W's. So yeah. And then this next one, I don't know. I I was on, uh, I was on Bontarin and uh, I don't know. I I wasn't on, I wasn't on, I wasn't on the under, but Liam, let's talk about this because this is, this is definitely the talking point of the whole night. And I, like I said, when we, when we first started talking about this uh, in the lobby, we were, I, I was saying to you, I respect. Obviously, I have no, I, I've never trained grappling before in my life. Just as my, uh, you know, my opinion as an observer, I didn't think he tapped. I thought it was just like he tried to yank his arm out, and it looked like he tapped. And then I was looking on the internet and listening to other people on YouTube and stuff like that right after it happened, and listening to people who are trained. And you know, you told me the. No, yeah, he tapped. And just tell me what you told me uh, earlier with just the one, the one tap, the famous one tap with Chael and stuff like that. I think that is what what happened here. And uh, yeah, it it sucks that for those who had the under, this is a pretty rough one. So yeah, Liam, talk to me about this one. Well, you know the thing, man. I actually think it's like almost um, 
you know, it's more of an MMA thing than it is a grappling thing, though it happens in grappling from time to time as well. The culture in grappling is to tap like aggressively, like to like let the person know to make it like super clear, like three taps, like, like, you know, vigorous tapping, you know, right. most people don't go like, you know, it, it's like very clear, evident, get me out of here. And that's a universal sign of surrender, right? Right. But yeah. There's yeah, yeah. this like, gray area that you could use where you go. And now the person who's executing a hold, they might have you in a position where your arm's about to break, hyperextend, do permanent damage. And they're like, I want to be a gentleman. I don't want to hold on to this. He's he's conceding. But now, you know, these are dirty, rotten cage fighters at the end of the day, man. And if you give them a, an inch, they're going to take a mile. So Bontarin looks up at the referee. He goes, oh, you're not stopping it? See ya. And just starts passing the guard. And uh, I do think, um, you know, when I rewatch the clip, you know, a number of times, I, what looks like happens to me, and this is one man's opinion, right? Uh, I did. I saw other, you know, people I respect, analysts I respect that, that feel the same way. Um, you know, probably a lot of other bitter uh, backers of Roy Val or the sub or sub round three or fight ends in round three or fight doesn't go or under 2.5, you know, a lot of bitter betters probably as well. So I want to concede that that might be, um, you know, part of my, my uh, influence here, but all due respect, I thought it was a pretty clear Brazilian. I thought he went, Duh! look around. Am I good to go? Okay. I'm out of here. And it's happened a lot in mixed martial arts before. And, you know, people take what they can get away with. They put their feet in the cage. They grab a hold of it. They wait till the referee pulls it off. It's like, if you are not getting stopped, it's almost like criminal to your career to not foul, to like get out of these holds and whatever. half your paychecks on the line on the other side of this uh, outcome. So, you know, I really don't blame these people for, for the things that they do uh, in, in the heat of battle, but that's what it looked like to me. It looked like he tapped, he wanted out, his arm was about to break. I, I thought it was a really deep arm bar. And uh, I thought Roy Val, you know, gave that, that inch. It doesn't take, you know, him completely letting go of his arm. I thought he like, looked like he was going to readjust or let go or whatever and look at the referee himself and then Bontarin's gone. You know, that's all it takes. Yeah, and, like, he he looked at the referee, too. That's what sold it to me so much. Like, at first I was like, no, no. And then when I saw that other video from, like, cage side where he just, like, turned around and looked at the referee really quickly, it was just like, oh, yeah, he that's a tap. Like, it's, it's one of those weird, like uh, – it's i feel like there was there was like this human uh natural human reaction there where he he kind of just like pulled his arm away and didn't realize that he was pulling his arm out of the threat that it was in by pulling it to go to tap and the the ref made an error while he made like a mental error and it was very weird and the only person that didn't benefit from it was Brendan Roy Val who luckily won the fight and uh this is weird this is just a weird fight uh locks what did you have on this one i didn't have anything uh on this one thankfully because uh like you said it was a weird fight i probably would have lost some money but uh yeah I, I i tend to agree i think that he did tap i agree with what uh liam's analysis there i'm obviously going to defer to the expert on this topic and uh yeah it makes sense to me when i was watching it live i definitely thought that he tapped and at the end of the day, Roy Val gets the win, so all's right in the world. And he's ranked number five right now. I don't really know if this is going to bump him up the rankings personally ahead of uh, Perez. I would like to, you know, maybe you give him like Pantoja for the next title shot after the winner of Askarov and Kaikar of France or something like that. I'm not really sure what you do uh, next, but in the top five, man, it's interesting to uh, see what matchup he's going to get next. And this was a good flyweight scrap tonight, even though it was a little bit weird. Yeah, I think that he might his best opportunity is to do what he just what he said is to stay on weight. And, uh, you know, speaking of people that are, you know, prone to breaking the rules, <laughs> we have Devison Figueredo is going to try to uh, go for his uh, to recapture the men's flyweight gold. And uh, yeah, if, if Roy Val can it stay stay in that conversation and you know, head to Anaheim and be a backup in case they're definitely going to have a backup for that one, especially with COVID. Like, I don't think they're going to be able to afford to have a fight fall through. So I wouldn't, you know, it's, that's one of those things where it could totally happen. And uh, it was just, 
I just wanted to go back here just in the way that this it was a split decision and I felt like this is one of those fights where the refs uh the judges got it right where you know if you wanted to like if you judge it by like uh you know the western style of MMA like I feel like you can make an you could easily make a case that Bonturin won the fight just by control but if you're going by like you know the the classic standard of an MMA win, like I guess the pride rules or the modern pride rules, you could say, you know, Roy Val won the fight, but if you wanted to say like B Bonterin might have, he, there's I a thought he won the rounds. Yeah, he won the rounds, but Roy Val won the fight. And I didn't, I, that the way that that split decision was, it was like, I saw it go either way, but it, it was just one of those, the MMA gods were like, no, we had this, this needs to be this. And it, it was just so clear too, because Roy Val was the only, he's had five fights now in the UFC. He's three and two. Uh, and uh, prior to this, two wins by stoppage, two losses by stoppage. So this is his first fight that's gone the distance or did it, you know? So it's, it's, it's super, it's super wild. And the, both of these fights, uh, or this fight, you know, to go the distance was plus money. And I feel like with both of these guys for it to go over two and a half rounds for it to go the distance at plus money, uh, that was the side that I was on. And, you know, that I have 1%. It's, it's not something that I'm going to, you know, be uh, gleeful about because of what happened here, but it, it's just one of those things where, you know, you'll get it back. They'll, you'll, you'll be able to get this one back. We'll be talking about this one. Where you'll end up getting, uh, you know, a suck out or something like that. Where you'll uh, you'll be on the right side because that that tends to happen. Where especially in this sport, because how many times, you know, there there seems to be a guy that's maybe on a, you know, that's on a quit job or something like that. And you end up getting a good read where the guy could have went a little bit further, and the ref stops it early. So we'll get there. So yeah, as far as just. I thought that that fight should have been the co-main event because this fight, this heavyweight bout, Jake Collier uh, defeated Chase Sherman. Cash is a one minus one thirty favorite, uh, plus five hundred. Or no, he cashed. Uh, he he won by submission. Actually, I filled out my results here incorrect. The under cashed plus one fifty. Fight goes to distance. No plus one thirty. I was on Collier here. I thought it was a pretty rudimentary play just as he's at more just more skills overall sherman was had one ch way to win this fight and it was by knocking him out and collier as soon as he brought wrestling into the fight it was I, it was pretty much a foregone conclusion locks did you have anything on this one <laughs> i didn't uh, i feel like i went to the dollar store and asked for glover versus yawn and then they gave me this <laughs> one like <laughs> this was uh kind of a funny fight uh, i thought collier was the side here i didn't play it chase sherman is just like pretty bad uh to be honest i'm not really sure how this got the co-main i would have given roy val in that slot it's kind of beyond me how uh they didn't give it to that fight but yeah jokes aside i mean collier is actually sort of good pretty decent striking like not a ton of power but good volume and i think he should be on a three fight win streak right now i honestly thought he beat carlos felipe uh when i watched that fight and he was the superior fighter standing, uh, got the fight down, and rear naked choke win. Only needed about half a round to do it. I can't tell you that I saw it going that way many times out of 100, but uh, here we are. A good win for Collier. Um, I think we're, I don't know, getting close to done with Sherman now. I mean, he's like three and eight in the UFC or something like that. He's lost three straight. <laughs> the last two were Parker Porter and Jake Collier, like via rear naked choke within minutes. So, like, <laughs> I don't know, man. We might be done with the Chase Sherman experiment, but uh, yeah. Yeah, even as like for Bellator PFL standards, it that might be uh yeah, like if, if people are ripping on other promotions, like we just watched Jake Collier and Chase Sherman in the co main event of a oh. UFC event, man. Like, yeah, L Liam, did you have anything on this one? Me. Oh, god, yeah, dude, the, it's actually my most shameful bet on the card. Uh, I had uh Chase Sherman here, um, for for uh for two units and um. You know, I redeemed myself, thank goodness, by, uh, you know, making slight profit. I also played one unit on the under 2.5 at plus 150. I played uh, 0.4 units on the under uh, 1.5 at plus 250. Uh, and I felt like, you know, Sherman 
like you said, was pretty KO or bust here. Uh, I was betting based on um, him coming out here, throwing recklessly in the pocket and trying to get him out of there. I actually did think he hurt uh, Collier briefly, but yep. uh, it was it was no moss because uh, he got wrestled. I just didn't expect Collier to wrestle at all. You know, that that threw me for a loop. As soon as he did that, I was like, oh, my God, he's going to get the submission too because I had uh, untracked uh, – Fight ends by knockout at plus 155. I thought that was a good look as well for a heavyweight fight. And uh, unfortunately not to be, I thought he was going to knock him out with those elbows, but instead Chase Sherman just gave up. (laughs) 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 Well, you know, and like, and he tapped to the ground. It was just one of those straight up. It's not like he tapped because he needed, like he, he needed to like, or else he would have been choked out. It was like a tap to the ground, which is basically like a, you know, Head down. I don't know. Yeah. And like the only reason that I bet this, this fight and like, usually I would side on the way of this is a close fight between lower ranked heavyweights. Uh, give me the side of plus money is i just have this. First of all, the reason that this is a co-main event is because Dana white has like a sick fetish of putting bad heavyweight fights on the co-main events of fight cards. he That's just what he does. The last time that I believe that Chase Sherman, Parker Porter fight was happening at the same time that the uh, Mike Tyson, uh, Roy Jones Jr. fight was happening. That's what the, the UFC decided to co-program uh, against Tyson versus Roy Jones Jr. They were like, we're going to put Parker Porter and Chase Sherman. That's the fight that we're going to. And th- I don't know what it is. But anyways, these fights are usually between two lower ranked heavyweights. And they're usually coin flips with the favorite being between minus 150 mm-hmm. to plus like, you know, to uh, pick them. So in those the past 12, the favorite in the heavyweight division has won nine of them. So me just being a weirdo who tracks these kinds of things, because you're basically just handicapping the the odds makers just because somebody is saying that this guy is better than this guy. And it seems like at heavyweight, the, the odds makers have done a pretty good job of saying that this lower level heavyweight is better than this lower level heavyweight. Because in the end, with the level that with the amount of events that we're doing here and with the amount of changes that are happening i'm not gonna break this fight down you know but i am gonna bet on it so this is that's just the way that i've that i usually do it is i you know i i try to i try to bet these fights all as if they're just one weird fight of between you know six different low level (laughs) heavyweights and it it works out but uh this was one this is one though where a, a weird heavyweight fight where the fight goes the distance no was plus 130. Isn't that so strange? Under two and a half rounds closed at plus 150. Just one of those fights where the, the market was so convinced that uh, that it was just going to be, I believe just because of what I said, the Sherman Porter was just such a just slop fest heavyweight fight that people were like, oh, it's going to be just like that. And I also believe that people said, uh, you know, Collier said in the media day that, you know, we're just going to stand and bang. And usually when that happens, you know that one of those people who has had a smarter training camp is going to go out and wrestle, (laughs) you know, so uh, unless you're at the higher level. So that fight was a train wreck. I mean, not to be disrespectful for either guy, but it shouldn't have been the co-main event. At the very least, they put it. They should have put Shikagian on the, you know, on the co-main. Like, come on. Why don't they promote the flyweight division? Like. Roy Val and uh, Bontari yeah. is a clear fight to put there, but uh, I maybe they don't want to reward Bontarin because he uh, missed weight. I don't know, just a backwards theory. <laughs> and Roy Val's yeah, but th- two losses. Yeah, but, but didn't now they Chase want to put him in a title fight? What the f- what the fuck? But Chase, Chase Sherman took like over the way, over the amount of time to weigh in to weigh in at heavyweight. So I, it's just Dana has this sick. Not even Dana, whoever is doing the matchmaking for this particular program that they do with these lower fight night cards. I promise you, we'll keep seeing it every so often. It's just an absolute train wreck 
of a low level heavyweight fight is just sticks out like a sore thumb as a co-main event and anyways enough of that because this main event was honestly one of the just just you know people talk about like how awesome mma is just uh, just the way that it's a single 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 player sport and there's just the ultimate consequences and all this stuff but like you can't really you couldn't like you just can't define combat sports and betting on combat sports and just the essence of all of it you can't just you can't define it any better than this freaking fight and the story with this fight and the betting implications with this fight and just everything man this was just a piece of beauty and calvin cater comes in and pulls off a dominant uh upset over giga chikadze cashes at plus 215 i saw the best odds at plus 215 on the money line unanimous decision plus 550 on the decision prop over three and a half rounds cash at minus 120 fight goes the distance yes cashed by the skin of its teeth uh at uh, plus 180 and yeah uh liam what did you have on this one yeah, man. So, uh, again, one of my larger bets uh, on the fight card, I had Calvin Cater here, uh, 2.75 units between plus 210 and plus 200 on the money line. I also had one unit on uh, Calvin Cater to win the fight inside the distance in terms of my tracked bets here. Um, I had a $10 free bet uh, that I shared with everybody online. Uh, I told you guys I had a parlay. It was Court McGee to win by decision, Caitlin Shukagian to win by decision, um, uh, Excuse me. I'm blanking now. Um, (laughs) God, uh, it's making me sick to even think about it. But um, basically, Calvin Cater to win by KO was the closer. Uh, It was plus 410, and uh, it was to win $500 on a free bet. So would have been a nice little uh, chunk of change there uh, for no risk at all. But uh, instead, we we come up just short, and I thought Calvin finished him in in the closing seconds as well. So uh, you know, I, I wrote up a preview for this fight. You know, I was pretty sold on Calvin being a live underdog here. Um, he hits very hard. Uh, he's never really had a fight where he didn't land hard punches on his opponent. Um, but I think that what really stifles Calvin Cater is consistent volume. And that's not what to expect from Giga Chikadze. Uh He throws tremendous power. Uh, and he's dangerous for that reason. He hits very hard, but he also, you know, uh, overswings at times. We saw that uh, cost him in dire fashion. You know, he overswings on a kick, gets turned around, stands back up, and gets bully beat down, Matt returned by Calvin Cater from the body lock. And I told people that I expected wrestling here. Uh, they told me I was crazy. I was like, why? You'd be crazy not to wrestle this guy after seeing what just happened to Edson. So it's like, of course, you got to make this guy work. And I, I thought that after round one, Giga was cooked. I thought Galvin led the dance. I thought he won the fight really decisively. I thought the fight was eligible for stoppage from rounds four on. And, uh, you know, I really thought that, you know, his corner did him no favors there. Uh, Giga just just took from Calvin what uh, Calvin took from Max, which is a life-altering beating. And his eye is completely torched. And uh, he's got cuts all over the place. He took about 500 clean elbows to the head. It's like, it was brutal. And I think Calvin Cater, part of the reason he didn't finish is because he gassed himself throwing such a tremendous amount of volume at this guy's face, head, neck, and chest. And uh, he just wouldn't go away. Uh, Credit to Giga. I thought he would fold up shop. But I also think, you know, Calvin made one mistake in this fight, which is not going to the body more because he threw a lot of head strikes and beat the hell out of this guy's head. But I do think that he's softer to the body. He's got that long torso and, uh, I think making him taste his own medicine there uh, actually would have been more effective because he fights in bursts. And if you take the burst out of him by hitting him to the body, uh, then you can follow up with the head strikes. But I mean, who am I to tell Calvin Cater? He painted a goddamn masterpiece tonight. He made me a lot of money. um, And so I'm very thankful for him. But uh, I just wish that the referee or the corner could have intervened for Giga's safety and and got me, uh, you know, billies. Yeah, I mean, I have some thoughts about this one, but first, uh, locks. I feel like we were uh, in in pretty in pretty good, you know, unit throughout pretty much a lot of this card. Uh, what did you have? What did you think about this awesome main event? 
bad bet alert, guys. Get it out in the open. I had Jikaze money line in a parlay. It was my smallest bet of the night, so it wasn't like a night ruin or anything like that. But obviously, you know, it was a pretty shitty bet. Um, Cater just beat him pillar to post, way better cardio. Output wasn't like all that different in the first two rounds, but uh, Cater just handled the shots so much better. And like he was really getting affected by them. You could tell. I mean, Calvin ate them for breakfast. Giga ate them like he was being force fed his lunch, man. And he was exhausted by round three, bad body language. Pretty much stop kicking because Cater will just catch it and go to the wrestling. Just good fight IQ by Cater to mix that in. Um, he had an answer for everything that Giga gave him, and Giga didn't have any answers for Cater. I guess it's safe to say that we're not seeing Valk and Giga uh, for the next fight <laughs> instead of Korean Zombie, obviously. Uh, I didn't really like how vocal he was about that during the buildup to this fight. Kind of just felt like he was looking past Cater a little bit. Um, but yeah, Calvin Cater is back. I guess let the people know. He showed me. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it was, it definitely wasn't a bad bet because, like, I feel like this fight on, on, on Shikadzi's best day and on Cater's worst day, this fight goes way different. And the, the point of the fight, um, you know, first of all, was just, it was evident right off the hop that Cater's footwork, uh, improved exponentially, like, just absolutely exponentially. And, like I said, he, it's like he absorbed, what he learned from the beating that he took from Max and just the way that he was like using, uh, he was using, it was just so Max, like just the way that he was using G Giga's foot, like his pressure against him and just backing it up against the cage. And, you know, Cater was just putting so much pressure against him and without even having to throw a strike, you could just tell that Giga was trying to, at one point, you know, do that thing where he'd let him come to him and see if he would strike and then be like, oh, this guy's going to, you know, I, I don't have the, I don't have the skills to keep up in this. He's fainting and just constantly going in and out. And, uh, you know, I feel like Cater, his mistake in the fight with Max is he, he, he does this thing where he covers up, up the middle and just takes, he just has this calculated way to, he just, he just wants to take punches to give it back. And he has this weird hide guard and he didn't see that him do that much in this fight. But the, the, the um, you did see him do that at one point and it led to the turning point of the fight, which is just in the, I guess in the midpoint of the first round, right off the hop when Shikadzi slipped and uh, you know, and then uh, Cater jumped on him, got him, you know, they had a little bit of a scramble got him down and it, they just uh, just that from that point on it just made Shikadzi so much less dangerous and Shikadzi had to wear on himself to get out to just to defend the position you know and just that little jiu-jitsu scramble on the ground uh it was pretty slick from Cater uh and just even to even to like let him put him in that stupid guillotine that that Giga had him in, you know, it was just it was it was very Poirier uh, Poirier against Connor in the second fight. It was very much just like calculated wrestling, just to wear on your opponent right off the hop. And then Giga starts to become a little bit more predictable as the fight goes on, and then Cater starts doing you know just unbelievable like switching stances to draw him in. And, uh, you know, Sh Shikadzi was a lot, uh, he was a lot more dangerous when Cater was in th the one stance where he was able to throw that kick up the middle and Cater was going to it to, to bait him, you know, and uh, it was, like I said, it was, he, what Max did to him, he took and absorbed it and did it to Shikadzi. And it just, it was, he got into like that flow state, that same exact flow state that Max was in with those spinning elbows. And he kept doing, it was, he styled on him and, uh, and then making Shikadzi swing and miss. And Giga Shikadzi is a very, very dangerous fighter. Okay. So like there's moments of that round where Cater is the type of guy where he's starting to engage. It was very, like I said, Dustin Poirier, like, with his MMA boxing where he uses his own opponent's timing against him with those check hooks. And, you know, you even saw Cater starting to land kicks up the middle, like the, the, the liver kick and stuff like that, just toying around with him. And I, like I said, you couldn't have literally, you couldn't have written it any better if it was a, 
you know, a piece of Boston fight folklore. Like this was a year to the day that Calvin Cook Cater comes back from getting dominated by Max Holloway and uh, just unreal. And one thing that I need to point out, because like I personally don't really like Giga Shikadze, just his personality. I like uh, we're built different and talking about like that and Georgia and when you really like break down what he's saying and just like the, just the arrogance of it. And yeah, it was, this is one of those things that was just really, you know, rewarding to see him just get that beating uh, that he wanted. Basically he wanted this fight. And when you, I think, I don't think he was overlooking cater. I think that he just thought that he was that good that he could be, you know, that he could just walk over him. But I will say this, uh, G Calvin Cater and Giga Shikadze both did not get paid enough money for this fight for our own personal entertainment. And they both took a lot of brain damage tonight and, you know, things that they'll, you know, both guys, especially Shikadze, you know, won't, won't ever be the same after that fucking 25 minute fight that us fucking idiots, you know, watched and bet our money on. And uh, just as like a moral obligation, you know, it, it, that needs to be said is like, whatever those guys are getting paid, it's, it's, def not it's definitely not enough. Because as, even what I just said about Shikadze and like how I personally feel about him, that doesn't even matter. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, it's he definitely deserves to get so much more twice as much money four times as much money that he got tonight because even with the the, the fight bonus like fight of the night fifty thousand dollars you're gonna give him fifty thousand dollars for that the medical yeah. bill is not gonna be fifty thousand dollars <laughs> you know like the medical bill is gonna be way more than fifty thousand dollars if you want to calculate it so that's just my rant on, and I don't even like Giga Shikadze, but you got to, I'm advocating for all of them because, you know, that's just, how do you, how do you watch that and say, you know, I think these guys are paid fairly. That's that, especially when we're betting on them t for our own personal gain, you know, you know, like at the very least. So that's my rant on that and just unbelievable. And yeah, I can't, I, whenever, Calvin Cater fights again if he's going to be uh, uh, maybe overinflated because of this performance. It, I'm I'm going to be right there, and I think uh, I was I tweeted out right before we started uh, the fight to make is him and Ortega, right? Liam, what do you think of yeah. that? I would love to see that. That's what um, you know. I was just discussing uh, real briefly on on Twitter Spaces as well with my man Chance. Um, I think that 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 is uh, very likely the fight that we see next for both guys. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, both guys who are coming off, you know, kind of like those those beat down type losses um, in the rebuilding stage. So I think that 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 would be a great matchup. And uh, you know, I, I went pressed earlier. I thought Ortega would probably open as a slight favorite in that matchup. I don't know how you guys feel about that, but uh, yeah, I think it would be uh, an interesting fight. Should be good fun. Uh, I don't. I'm not even gonna say it. locks. What do you think that that fight should be lined at? What do I think? What do I think it's gonna be lined at, or what do I think it should be lined at? Oh yeah, that's a yeah, that's a good way to frame it. What do you think it will be lined at? Yeah, I agree with Liam. I think that uh, Ortega is gonna probably open as a favorite in that one. Um, Probably nothing too crazy, but like a, a slight favor, probably. Yeah, I could. I just so see it being like Ortega, right in that like minus one thirty five range. Yeah, like it'll be it like a little be. bit, like a little bit of a swell, uh, like a a coin flip, like a coin flip fight, but in that minus one thirty five plus one fifteen range. And to be honest, I think that's fair. You know, like I, I, I think that's, I, I think. Ortega should be favored. And I think that that's, you know, as far as implied probability goes, I think that that's a fair line. I don't know who I would bet on that fight. I, that's, I'd have to break that down. I, I don't, I can't call it like, uh, yeah, that's a tough, like off the top of my head. Do you guys have any thoughts, Liam on that? Just as handicapping um, that fight. Yeah. I, all I would say is that Calvin Cater as an underdog has been a good bet in the UFC. Uh, that was part of my rationale for making this wager. 
Uh, you know, the ROI on Giga Jakadze as a favorite was 3% going into this fight. Uh, that was a that was a red flag for me. But again, that was from a long time ago, the loss to Austin Springer. So you, how much can you really take into account, um, you know, that kind of result? But I, I do think that Calvin it was like proven as an underdog, but it had been a while. So I think that's why people had lost faith in Calvin as an, under, an underdog. He was so closely lined with Max. And then the fight doesn't look close. So I think that that led, um, you know, to a little bit of dismissal oh, yeah. of Calvin in this spot. And, you know, Calvin has really fought a pretty high level of competition. So I think, um, you know, I wouldn't put it past him to walk uh, Brian Ortega around the octagon, give him the tour as well. <laughs> yeah. And like, it, like I just, like I said, I, I don't really know who else he would face that he would be an underdog against that even – you know, besides Volkanovski, obviously, besides Holloway, obviously, he would be the underdog in both those fights. Even if he fought um, uh, Zombie, Emmett. even if he fought Korean Zombie, I think that it would be in that same type of range where he'd be like a slight underdog, but nothing crazy. What was the one that you said, Liam? Uh, Josh Emmett is the other, um, you know, big oh, fight right that's, now. Either way, that's a great fight. That's a crazy fight. That's... That's yeah, that um, would be madness. And we would need to get those guys better contracts for that fight, huh, Al Mac? Yeah, and Somebody, that, somebody's losing a brain cell in that one, I would think. I feel like I feel like that I don't I don't like the that matchup just because I like those two guys as separate entities so much more, you know? Like I, I don't like Yeah, I like it too. I like both guys as well. I wouldn't want to see either one lose right now. But that's and, how I feel about all these featherweights, man. I like Billy Q, I like Shane Burgos, man. I like a lot of these guys. Yeah, the featherweight division is just wild. So, yeah, before uh, we close out on this one, yeah, well, like we were just saying, Calvin Cater, absolutely dominant. And Cater improves to 7-3 and three since coming into the UFC in 2017. And he's turned a profit of $622 on the money line if you bet $100 on every one of his fights since he came in. So that's $62 per fight, win or lose. Uh, yeah, so you don't, that's a, he's just, you know, even, even as a personality, I don't even really like Calvin Cater, but just as a fighter and the essence of what he did tonight is just, it's, it's so much of like why MMA is the absolute very best sport to bet on and to follow in gambling, because this was just, uh, and locks. I'm not even trying to like, <laughs> I'd like to like gloat. It's just like this was just like with, with what we said with him coming off that such a bad beating and Chikazi looking so good coming off that good fight against Barboza. This was just like a chef kiss spot, and I uh, yeah, just unbelievable, unbelievable performance. And both those guys don't get paid enough. So hats off to them. And then let's talk about the, uh, you know, what whatever's going to go down next weekend. UFC 270 uh, going down from Anaheim. And I'll say this, it's, it's tough to call this because we're, you know, seven days out. But there's a couple factors here that I think that people aren't considering at all here. One, COVID is, is rampant. They haven't had a sanctioned event in california during covid this whole time so this will be the first time that that happens for the ufc at least bellator did do it but the ufc hasn't done it and the ufc the calif uh, the california state athletic commission is notoriously just more strict on all of this stuff uh than any other state so we'll probably see um a fight pullouts or fight you know tentative cancellations because of you know, unclear tests. Like I can definitely see that happening. And then another thing is there's a giant uh, uh, volcano that erupted in the middle of the South Pacific, like a huge volcano that's going to interrupt uh, travel. Uh, I, I don't know if, if everybody has come in for this fight as far as uh, whatever international fighters are on this card. So that plus COVID plus just general, you know, you know, everyday nonsense. Uh, I, I think we can talk about pulled out already, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I feel like this is one of those things with the, what I like to do on this show has been like, do the look ahead, 
but this we're in this weird little climate where like we, you know we already talked about moreno figueredo we already talked about francis nagano and cyril Gan. i mean un like just the crazy storylines for those fights alone is just nuts but it's just <laughs> this whole card i feel like we have to play it by day this is going to be I, I i feel like what we see it coming up right now versus what it's going to be next week is going to be very different and with that said uh do you guys have any spots that you that you like per se liam um yeah so uh i only have one bet locked in and to be honest with you the closer we get to fight time you know um the less confident i feel in it but Basically, one of the strategies I take to betting is that I try and look at lines and predict which lines are going to move because that gives yeah. me options. If I then change my mind, I can try and arb out at a better price on the other side. Um, so that's something that I try and do. Um, and I, I felt like there was going to be steam uh, from the public coming in on the side of Brandon Moreno here uh, because there was a draw in the first fight. He wins the second fight pretty decisively. So again, for recency bias, um, and everything else, you'd think uh, the champion would be favored, uh, you know, in the rematch here. But we have seen that, um, you know, pretty wholesale lifestyle changes from Figueredo. Looks like he's got a different body coming into this fight. You know, take that for whatever it's worth. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I might be interested in middling out um, if this price uh, hits like plus 165, plus 170 uh, on the Figueredo side. Then I'm sitting there, you know, halfway to being a bookmaker. Uh, that's fine by me. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm going to play this one out. I'm going to revisit the tape here, but yeah, I basically just thought I'd get an early price and I hit minus 162 minus 167 right now is the best market price. So, um, you know, we'll see how that line moves. Yeah. I'm just looking at this fight card. This is, this is quite an interesting scenario that's breaking down here. Uh, lucky locks. Do you have anything on this looking ahead that you think is interesting? Um, yeah, I actually have three plays uh, on this card. I have a small stab quarter unit on Cyril Gaon unanimous decision at plus 550. Um, I have a shot on uh, Wellington Terman and Rodolfo Vieira over one and a half at minus 105. And I also have a half unit play on Wellington Terman in that fight at uh, plus 225. Yeah, like that's that's an interesting fight. I could, that's the headliner prelim right now is Randolfo Vieira and Wellington Terman and uh yeah this car is Cody Stamen and uh, Sayad Nurmagomedov that's another one that'll be interesting that's up in the air I, I don't know if it's up in the air but I'm just saying that's one of those fights that I could see not <laughs> being the same fight that it is you know a week from now that it is today and then there's uh with Ilya Tabura and Charles Jordan that's an awesome fight let's I, I, I mean, just to you know, pre, like to rapid fire handicap that fight, Ilya Tapura and Charles Jordan. I feel like that's that f just based on on the top of my head, the featherweight division goes over like a crazy amount, like seventy percent of the time. I feel like this fight, just with the the wrestling of Tapura, and I, I feel like this fight is kind of it's uh it seems like it's going to go the distance and if there's a decent price on an over two and a half or a fight goes the distance even in that like minus 145 or better range i think that's a solid solid look uh liam do you, what do you think about that 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 could make sense to me i'd have to revisit the tape on the uh jordan grappling though i know he's a black belt but you know, there's levels to being a black belt as well. I think Tapur is a, a handful on the ground, especially early. Um, and Jordan is scrappy, but, you know, we've seen him, you know, look his best on the feet. I did, uh, you know, fade him in a few of his fights. I think he's been a little bit overvalued at times by the market. Then they made me eat my words on Andre Ewell. He looked like he was minus, you know, 50,000 in that fight. Um, but I'm interested to see how he does in this fight on short notice. Ilya Tapuria, um dangerous guy as far as i'm concerned yeah i the thing charles jordan is coming off that that pretty awesome performance uh what was that like a couple weeks ago and yeah i'm with the way that the odds are now though 
Tapura is lined at minus 400 and Jordan at plus 400, but over one and a half rounds, minus 150. That seems a that seems a little bit like easy money to me, in my opinion. Like, like if based on that, if the over one and a half rounds right now is at minus one fifty five, I feel like at some point you might be able to get like fight starts round two at like minus one seventy five, and I I think that that's good value because everyone's gonna think that this is one of those spots where everyone thinks is gonna think that Topura is gonna run over Jordan. At least not everybody, but you know the people that that aren't uh full-time mma betters or the casuals let's say they're uh they're gonna look at this matchup and think that tapir is gonna run over jordan and he might do it quickly and those are always one of those spots where jordan's pretty capable especially early on i think that he's gonna be able to at least last to the second round uh but honestly beyond that like let's just uh, i we gotta re just revisit the the main event I mean, as far as just the storyline in the main event, uh, I I want to see Francis Nagano win. I think that that would just put a crazy wrench in the the this whole uh, saga that's been the heavyweight division. And do I think it's going to happen? No. Uh, I feel like they're kind of bargaining this Tyson Fury fight right now for Francis Nagano to stay with the ufc in case he loses or in case he wins i have no idea what's going on but like if nagano wins this fight it's going to change the landscape of the ufc if gone wins this fight it, i feel like it's going to keep the landscape in the direction that it's going as far as handicapping goes i think gone's going to win this fight pretty easily uh just kind of like a a weird insight that i had I don't even know what this is, but I saw this like viral video going around of these two, uh, like I guess they're MMA Twitter personalities, like having a like a uh, like an, a boxing match in a park. Have you guys seen this? Do you guys know I what I'm talking seen, about? I haven't seen that. Sounds funny though. It's it's just I, it's two kids who are like. I think one of them kind of knows how to box and the other one just looks like that. If he hit the other kid, he probably hurt him very badly. And it's just like a, they're taping this event, this, you know, 15 minute three round fight. And it's mostly just a staring contest with like a couple, it's just a, you know, fun sparring, but with you know, nobody really wanted to take chances. And I feel like that's what the, the, the first like two rounds of, this fight is going to be is it's just going to be a dreadful dreadful stalemate like remember when cyril gone fought uh volkov and dana white walked out of the 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 fight before the fight was even over that's i feel like that's how bad this fight is going to be as far as just a staring contest and uh i think overs in this one what what do you think about that one locks yeah, I don't mind. Oh, uh, I think the over one and a half is like minus 163 or something like that. I think I saw that on Betway. Um, I don't think that's bad. Obviously, I have <laughs> the uh, the small stab on Gon unanimous decision. Um, yeah, like I could see uh, Gon just staying out, of, staying out of range early and kind of just working him from the outside. Um, lots of money coming in on Gon right now. I don't know if I'd really feel comfortable on the money line there, but if he does win, I feel like he probably does look like a pretty big favorite. Um, I'm interested to see what the lines are going to look like on uh, like the round grouping props, like in Ganu by KO in round one, two, and three, or like gone to win in four or five or decision. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm still leaning gone from a straight prediction standpoint, 25 minutes not to get knocked dead. Easier said than done. Uh, we'll see how it shakes out. But yeah, straight up prediction wise, I like zero gone to win this. Yeah, I notoriously have a really bad habit of trying to like middle these type of like high level heavyweight fights to say like, okay, the, you know, Gon's going to either win by decision or Nagano is going to knock him out and I get pl plus money on both sides. And then what ends up happening is like, I tried to do that with uh yawn versus um, Adesanya. And I was like, there's no way yawns winning this fight by decision. That's not happening. And that's what happened. So I'm not going to do that here. Uh, do would I be absolutely godsmacked if Francis Naganu won this fight by decision, especially right now with all of the implications going on? 
yes, I would be completely shocked if Francis Nagano won this fight somehow by a five round decision. That would be a reality that I can't say that I I can see happening. But I've I've said that before on this on this YouTube channel, and I've been wrong, so I'm not going to say it again. So besides that, I feel like this fight card next week is a conundrum and like besides these two fights like i really hope you know roy val is a backup <laughs> i d are they gonna have a backup for francis nagan like if if yeah this is this will be a very interesting week and yeah parker porter dude they've got him standing at <laughs> the ufc headquarters right now dude <laughs> ready to hit the ground running <laughs> Uh, I, I don't even mean to laugh. I actually, I, Parker, I've made money betting on Parker Porter. He's awesome because the, he's one of those guys that I talked about where like, you know, people think he sucks and that he's going to get knocked out quickly. And then he ends up winning by decision. Uh, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> didn't he fight John Jones? <laughs> yes, he did. Yes, yes he, did. he did. And uh, I mean, as far as the heavy, the backup for that fight, I, there won't be one, I don't think. Or maybe what, Derek Lewis? Are they going to bring Derek Lewis in last minute? Like, that would be a kind of a – yeah, I mean, I guess they could. For a three-round fight, he'll do it. <laughs> For non-title non title fight. fight. No, 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 three-round title fight. He specified. He wants it, you know, just little modified rules. That's all. I think heavyweight title fights should be three rounds. Fuck it. Let's get the best out of these guys. Or no, five round, five three minute rounds. That works too. Rock and roll. With, yeah, give with, them a little bit of rest so we get them with the extra in. time. The extra time is, is is there. It's just they don't. They're not fighting. Like the two minutes that I'm taking away is there. It's, they're just not fighting. That would be. See, we need to do more of that. Like that one X that's happening. I'm going on a complete tangent here, but like that one X that's happening. Like uh, Mighty Mouse is fighting that mixed. Uh, Mixed cage fighting rules with oh yeah against that, Rod oh, Tang yeah against Rod Tang that's gonna be so dope yeah good luck it, yeah so that's the state of uh, the UFC right now like beyond that we got a whole bunch of prospective fights that we don't know do you guys have any last words before we wrap it up here as far as the look ahead on UFC 270 yeah dude I will just add on the Ngannou and uh, Gon fight. Um, you know, one of the analysts I really respect, my man, Sean Orr told me, you know, gone is going to win this fight, Liam. Don't bet France. It's like, uh, you just be wasting your money. And, uh, so I'm going to take that opinion seriously and, and do the tape study again and, and look back into it. But, um, in a fight at heavyweight where there's a lot of, uh, chance for a knockout, you know, we saw it with a fight that everybody assumed was going to go to decision tonight. It ends like instantly. Both guys get completely rocked backwards, uh, you know, early. I think Gon has good distance management. I think that, you know, broadly speaking, he does a really good job uh, managing the range. He uses the teep kick. That was Sean's, you know, the crux of his argument. He's like, it's longer than a jab. He can keep you far away. Uh, and I think all of that makes sense. But we saw Francis Ngannou uh, fight with complete, like, zero technique and knock Jairzinho Rosenstreich through, like, a portal. Like, that was no technique. That was just... These. And he fights Stipe, right? And uh, when he fought Stipe the first fight, we see that Stipe is like getting hit with punches from Ngannou with his mouth open like this. And, and he's still getting Pez Dispenser backwards, like stumbling across the cage and shooting desperation takedowns. And I say that as a huge fan of Stipe. I bet on Stipe the first fight, Ngannou the second fight, uh, because I, I had a feeling that it, it wasn't going to come to pass twice. And I thought, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of confidence on the Cyril Gan side here. And against somebody as dangerous, a puncher as Francis Ngannou, that's really troubling to me. You know, I look on the Bet MMA page, every bet is on Cyril Gan. You know, there's like three people on Francis Ngannou. That's a red flag for me. You know, and I don't give a fuck about what's going on outside of the cage, uh, largely speaking, when I try and handicap the fights because uh, so many things are said. Uh, that don't come to pass, you know? Uh, Roy Val said, I'm going to fight more reserved. Three minutes into the fight, he's like, oh, F all that, I'm going forward. You know, it's like, that's just how fighting is. It's chaotic. It, people revert back to what's natural. And I think, you know, 
Cyril might have this confidence about him because like, yeah, Francis doesn't try and take your head off in the sparring room. But I do think like when Francis is swinging that hammer, he can knock anybody's head off. It doesn't matter who you are or if you're better or anything else. So I think he showed in the second Stipe fight, his wrestling has improved. Um, so whether or not he could do that for five rounds, it's like if he can keep this upright for 15 minutes, I think he's dangerous at least for that amount of time. And, you know, all it takes is one mistake at heavyweight for you to be snoring, even if you're really good at fighting. And Cyril Gunn, what is this, nine, 10 fights as a pro? You know, 11 fights as a pro. And he's going to take on Francis Ngannou for all the marbles. The UFC is like backing him as their pony and he's the favorite. Like that's a lot of fucking pressure. And you're representing your coach who's fighting his former guy who everything's on the line. It's like, yeah, no, nobody's ever folded under that pressure before. Yeah, but you didn't even, you didn't even explain half of the implications when you just said, you know, like like this is what we're like for me as a as a better like um, the gain that I would have of betting Francis Naganu personally and financially does not equal to the gain that I would get non-monetary to see him win in this matchup and just give the f u to the UFC and Dana White and who knows what happens at that point because you know Francis Ngannou has already said he's not re-signing for the money that he's he's going to make like currently so I would I like to see that yeah I would like to see that a lot <laughs> you know uh would I like to win money betting on the other side yeah sure so the it's I just have to weigh it, I, I, I'm not going to bet on Naganu. It's either I'm either going to bet on gone or nothing here. And uh, there's just too much non-monetary gain as far as just someone who, outside of just you know covering it from a betting perspective, just covering it from a storyline perspective, like just the the wrench and just the tangent timeline that this is going to put the UFC on if Francis Naganu wins this fight versus if he loses. It's just, it's just crazy, and it's just crazy that this fight is happening in Anaheim. Oh, there's just so much. This is a disaster <laughs> waiting to happen. Just an absolute train wreck. This card is an absolute train wreck waiting to happen. So, I guess with that, it we can say, are we? I'm, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here this time, this time next Saturday. So. Uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen. It's going to be who even knows if it'll be gone in Nuganu fight that fight. <laughs> uh, who knows is right. But all I'll say is this, Al Mac, I could see, you know, what's to say that, uh, you know, Gan gets hurt two or three times in this fight and it costs him rounds. Like, he could win four minutes of a round against Nuganu, get clipped with a punch, and then he loses the round. You know, I, that's the other thing I would say is like, I, I don't think it's the most likely outcome, you know, and Ganu by decision is like probably not, you know, uh, a 50% outcome. Obviously it's like, but where is it? I, I don't think it's a 0% outcome either. Like I, I could definitely see a, 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 you know, a number of paths to gone, um, you know, losing these early rounds to Francis based on the power differential. Naganu by decision right now is 13 to one. And to me, that's not a, that wouldn't be enough value. I would honestly want like twenty to bet that, just because of how unlikely I think that that is to happen. But you have just made a great case for it to happen, and yeah, I I rarely am like I'm not touching this one from multiple sides because I love to like get in on both sides of a number on fights. This this whole card seems like. And just to close before, like the the co-main event, the co-main event is is going to the trilogy of this flyweight fight is absolutely awesome. Uh, Devison Figueredo is you know uh, just an absolute destroyer and taking on the assassin baby. This is going to be a, a an awesome fight. But the thing about this fight is we can't really break this down until we see both these guys healthy on the scales because we've seen Figueredo multiple times miss weight or health ha have health problems uh not look good last time he had to take like the extra 
uh, 30 minutes and just looked completely sucked out coming in uh, for the, the the rematch that he lost. And then we know everything that happened with the, the first fight, uh, the draw, and, you know, where he had, like, uh, rehydration poisoning and the fight was almost not going to happen. Um, so I feel like there is a case to be made for Devison Figueredo at plus money. But you just – it's not uh, – you got to – look you. You have to play it by the day, and you just got to keep looking and measuring the expectations because I I just see I know that he's looked awesome. He's looked like completely different. But who's how? Like I don't know. There's just so many. There's so many unknowns. Uh, that's a tough fight to break down. <laughs> like I've gone I've gone complete full circle where I was just like, yeah, no, it's it's Moreno all day. But now I'm really starting to think that. There might be some value in Figueredo, but you're kind of betting into a lot of uncertainty. So it's you you got to just like manage expectations and bankroll management. I don't know. I don't know. I've, I've, I'm completely talking myself out of this fight. Uh, Locks, do you have any thoughts on the Moreno Figueredo fight? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Like, Figueredo opens minus 275 the first time and closes north of minus 320. And I thought he won that fight. Um, next fight, he opens up at minus 240, closes around there. The line tightened up a little bit, but not much. And now he's plus 150 in this one after, you know, let's be real. It was a bad performance last time, but I still think it's a maybe a little bit of an overreaction. I mean, I'm kind of with you there. I think there is a little bit of value on Davidson Figueredo, but you hit the nail on the head with the uncertainty. It's just like, I mean, last time we talked about this, I was saying, I think that on his best day, Figueredo beats anybody at 125, but how many more of those best days are they're going to be at this weight class? So it's, it's all going to come down to how healthy he is and uh, how good the weight cut is. And that's really the big uncertainty there. And then that's the big unknown when you're, when you're trying to break this one down. But yeah, at plus 150, I'm, I'm starting to think pretty hard about uh, Davis and Figueredo here. Yeah, Liam, I know that you, you, you touched on it. What, what do you think about this matchup? Yeah, I think um, broadly speaking, um, Getting this kind of plus money figure uh, on the former champion is not a terrible look. Um, he's been competitive with this guy. Uh, we know that he could hurt him at his best. Uh, but, you know, the question is, I think Locke's hitting the nail on the head when he's talking about the timing of this fight. You know, it's like uh, timing is everything. And Davison was at the peak of his powers the first time when they fought to the draw. You know, then he was a little bit diminished. He gets completely outclassed. Now he's changed his whole life to try and uh, close the gap here again. And that's possible. But, you know, I don't want to think that Brandon Moreno, what has he just been uh, drinking soda pop and like hanging out on the couch? Like, no, he's probably been training too. So uh, I think he's probably getting better as well. You know, I think it would take, um, you know, a pretty monumental effort here and, and everything going right physically. Um, so, I think Wayans is going to be critical here. Wayans yeah. uh, could probably shift the line tremendously, you know, and I honestly, this is the other thing, you know, Al Mack was talking about, um, you know, circumstances that causes fights not to happen and, and knock on wood here. Uh, but I, I think that, you know, it's, it's possible that we see, uh, you know, Figueredo miss weight. You know, I think he, he's very close to it right now. But all it takes is like one little uh, problem in the water load, the this, the whatever, uh, and you could fuck something like that up, especially with somebody whose weight is so sensitive. Um, oh, yeah. So oh, that, that's yeah. just something I'm concerned about. Yeah, with so many medical incidents uh, related to the weight cuts. But I think, I mean, he's approached this professionally um, and probably with medical intervention, you know. Yeah, but he has also botched it a couple of times, you know, like with his own professional advice, like, you know, people who claim to be professionals advising yeah. him have also botched this uh, operation. Uh, one thing that I will say that I, I feel that we're kind of not just to, like to be the devil's advocate, we're kind of just not mentioning that, you know, Moreno has reached like the precipice of his you know he fought so hard to get to this climax now he is champion you know it reminds me of like andy ruiz andy ruiz jr where it's like you know he he beat anthony joshua 
became the heavyweight champion, the first Mexican heavyweight champion. And then he goes in there in the rematch and just absolutely lays an egg. And I'm not saying that that Moreno is going to do that. It's just one of those things where it's like everyone's focusing on the storyline with Figueredo, but there needs to be some, you know, credence to the storyline of like Moreno has reached the apex of his goal and now he needs to defend it. It's not always as easy to do that, especially when you're coming off the fruits of your labor, you know, like it's, uh, and now you're talking about a guy in Figueredo who might be more motivated. I hate talking about motivation in MMA fights so much, but it's uh, this is one of those fights where it's so much outside of the, you know, just the realm of skill. It's n these non tangible factors, and that's what this fight basically breaks down to. And honestly, these two fights are the only two fights that I can really say that I'm going to spend a whole lot of time breaking down because the other ones. Uh, I, I just don't know what's going to happen. This card is going to be pretty fluid. So, yeah, uh, basically, I think that's going to be it. And, uh, yeah, next Saturday, who knows? But I'll be here. Uh, I, yeah, you guys will be here next Saturday, next Saturday night? Should All be. Right. Well, so that'll be uh, – it'll either be a very interesting one or like we won't go on to like 4 30 in the morning because they'll just be a com like uh what was it i can't remember the what was the number of, was it 228 when habib jumped the fence was that what it was it'll be like that night that's what we're headed towards this is one of those like we're headed towards that we're like it's supposed to be one of those great you know you know uh head cornerstone achievements for the ufc this big you know, unifying championship belt, and I could see this card being a freaking absolute train wreck. <laughs> so on that note, to recap that train wreck, come back here next Saturday. And uh, yeah, thanks. Hit us up uh, on Twitter, Almac Gods, Liam Picks Fights, Lucky Box Picks, and honestly thanks so much coming out here this is we've actually we're actually pretty early right now at 2 30 but for uh the first stream of 2022 i think you know pr pretty good any uh parting words before we uh head out liam uh i just wanted to say um thanks for everybody who's watching appreciate it um thank you for having me on i'm it's always a pleasure really enjoyed discussing the fights with you guys and uh you know, if you guys want to check out the work that I do, I write for Roto Grinders. Uh, gave Calvin Cater plus 200 as my pick in the main event um, with a lot of analysis that I felt like was sound to back it up. So, um, you know, pretty happy with how that turned out tonight. Uh, also went three for four on my bets on, uh, you know, uh, scoresandodds.com premium picks. So if you're interested in, in my most confident bets, um, you know, with really responsible unit sizing, that's where you go. And then, you know, the slate that I bet myself, that's what I put out uh, on betmma.tips, profited plus 4.29 units there uh, this week. So uh, find me everywhere. Liam Picks Fights on YouTube, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. Appreciate everybody for watching. And uh, I hope we enjoy, you know, a great slate of fights next week at Albac's uh, predictions of, of dire failures don't come quite as true as, as he's predicting. But, uh, you know, I, I see the same uh, fears potentially written on the wall. I mean, I don't I, I don't necessarily mean that if it's a train wreck, that it'll be bad for us. <laughs> short, short notice fights and like having to get, you know, handicapping fights like this on the fly, like honestly – I love this kind of stuff. I would rather do this kind of stuff of handicapping stuff short notice than do the you look ahead for two months, you know, because it's the, these fights with the weird volatility, like the, you know, guys fighting up a weight class. I absolutely love that stuff. Uh, Locks, have any uh, parting words before we get out of here? Yeah, man. Thank God fights are back. Good to have them back. Thank you, Al, for having me on tonight. And uh, thanks for everyone for tuning in. Can find me uh, on YouTube at Lucky Lux Picks on Twitter, same thing. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, Lux, you were crushing LFA, which has been super helpful for just, you know, so many times where I try to just like, oh, I'm going to handicap that. And I don't get to it because, you know, stuff just adds up. 
and I just go, I'm just going to completely tail everything that Locke says for this card. So that's it definitely... didn't work uh, yesterday, but uh, next week we got another one. So I got you there. No, but uh, yeah, it, it's all good. You, you come through, you, you know, you come through documented more times than not. And it's definitely, it just, it's a service where I get like fear of missing out when there's good MMA. Like today... I didn't I didn't bet on KSW and it it makes me sick. Like that's just I don't bet on other sports. So when I miss out on like high level MMA to wager on, it I, it makes me sick. So it's definitely a service to have because betting on fights is awesome and it's the best sport to bet on. So with that said, we'll be back at it uh next Saturday for what should be a very interesting card. And, yeah, hit us up on Twitter. And thanks a lot, guys. Talk to you later.